Bob Holt with us, sports writer extraordinaire from the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. Bob, I missed you last week, so I couldn't miss this week with you here. How you doing? Good to be back with you. I'm good. How are you guys? Uh, well, outstanding. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a. Uh, I, I made a. Um, I guess a statement that Peyton Manning is the greatest sports pitch man of all time. I already have a text in from B.E. who tells me that he thinks Broadway Joe Namath was a better pitch man. And then I don't know if Peyton Manning would have ever done, like, uh, jockey ads or worn a fur coat on the sidelines. Were there Could, mirrors on on Peyton Manning's ceiling? I don't right. think so. Could you, is there a better pitch man athlete ever than, than Peyton Manning in your mind? Um, yeah, I'd have to put him right up there. Uh, one thing about Joe Namath, I, you remember this? He actually did a pantyhose commercial where he wore pantyhose. Yep. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you remember. I guess it was in the seventies or something. They start off, you know, throwing the, these legs and pantyhose. They move all the way up, and then you see it's Joe Namath, and he says, "Who probably had I don't know five or six knee surgeries at that point." And he says something like, if, if, if they could make my legs look this good, imagine what they could do for yours. I was just speaking to a female audience. I don't know if Peyton Manning would ever do that, but I remember Peyton Manning being really funny when he hosted Saturday Night Live. And um, I saw him and his brother are going to do like an alternative Monday night broadcast, I mm-hmm. think, where you can watch a Monday night game and they'll be on a different uh, channel doing it. Which, because uh, I always thought Peyton Manning would be great as a as a color analyst, and I guess he just doesn't want to do it, or maybe don't want to have to travel and things like that. But yeah, Peyton Manning, um, he, he does a great job, great great sense of humor, obviously. Got uh, Steve Atwater going into the Hall of Fame too, uh, former Razorback safety, long time with the Denver Broncos. Saw where I forget what site it is, but a well respected site shows Atwater is the greatest Broncos draft pick ever. Now, you covered him at Arkansas. I remember watching him with with the Broncos. I, I grew up an NFL fan during that era. Nobody will forget his hit on Christian Okoye. But but when he played at Arkansas, was he the same kind of player that you saw those years with the Broncos? I mean, the really, really thundering hits that today would probably be outlawed. Yeah, he was a great player. It's crazy to think, but he actually redshirted. He was a fifth-year guy, but back in the 80s, it was, it was a different time. But you think about Steve being one of the greatest Razorbacks ever, and, and you know, obviously he's going to the pro football. He's one of the greatest football players ever, period. But, yeah, he was a big hitter. He got a lot of interceptions, too. I think I think he might hold the school record. I, I should know that. But I think he had, you know, 11 or 12 interceptions. He was a real ball hawk, but he was a huge hitter. You know, he's from St. Louis. And, um, yeah, just, just a great player. And, as far as the draft pick, I think him and Wayne Martin were drafted back to back, but I can't remember which one was first. But Martin went to the Saints, and that one went to the Broncos, like at twenty one or twenty two or twenty two and twenty three. Um, so maybe if you're talking about a value pick, um, but I mean, no offense to Steve Rains, but yeah, the Bart Starr was a seventeenth round draft pick. Of course, well, of course, you're talking about just the Broncos, and that's the greatest Bronco draft pick. Well, of course, Elway would. The Broncos. He was drafted by the Colts and forced to trade. So um, I'd have to analyze drafts. But yes, yeah, Steve's definitely he's one of the best Broncos ever, and he was drafted near the end of the first round. So that was a very good value pick for them. Bob, obviously, practice starting tomorrow. Me, uh, Sam Pittman, and a few players are meeting with the team today for their media availability. Other than finding out uh, who is available to start practice this week. What more can we actually learn from Sam Pittman that we haven't heard a thousand times this year and fr- uh, or a thousand times this summer and um, through media days? Is that really the only new information that we're probably going to get out of his availability today? It's just who's available to practice? Well, yeah, I mean, you obviously can't evaluate practice because they haven't practiced. And, and you know, the, the coaches aren't supposed to coach the guys during the summer. The, the guys can have workouts. Obviously, they're kind of organized by the players and the weight staff, the stream conditioning staff, you know, oversees all their conditioning work in the summer. Um, so, yeah, you'd like to know things like how is K.J. Jefferson throwing the ball? Uh, how is, uh, um, you know, Davion Warren, that big stick? Cause, you know, Sam said in Hoover that he'd be, you know, he'd be ready to practice. You kind of want to know 
Are they going to take it easy with him? Maybe he takes some time off in practice. They don't push that knee injury uh, too far. But, um, yeah, and, you know, maybe we can find out if there's some position moves. Maybe they decide over the summer after meeting. Uh, you know, coaches, I'm sure, have met a lot over the summer. Um, you know, would this guy be better in this spot? You know, and mm. we can just, you know, Sam didn't really want to comment on the Texas OU stuff in Hoover because it was, you know, a media report, but now it's officially been invited to join the SEC and accepted. So we might be able to get some feedback from them on that. Yeah, now that we're a month away from the start of season, where practice is finally here, is there, I know it, we're not, you're not going to be able to see a lot um, just due to the fact that uh, so many coaches, not just Sam Pittman, but throughout the country are so paranoid about letting any single thing out. Is there anything that you are looking for to help, you know, kind of maybe build confidence for you and and your readers um, for the season that it's going to be uh, an improvement? Well, like I said, I you know, K.J. Jefferson, I, I didn't uh, – I have to you know, confess her, I did not go to spring practice in the spring because I was busy with basketball, but I know – K.J. Jefferson and the quarterbacks were kind of hit and miss with their throws. They had some good days, some not so good days. So you'd like to see maybe what kind of progress they made over the summer, even if it's just in drills, not scrimmage situations. They can't be in full pass for a few days anyway. Um, like I say, you'd like to see how, how the guy like David Edwards is he able to go out there and go full speed, or does he have to favor that, that knee still? Um you know, but it, it, it's really hard to tell a whole lot until they get into pads because obviously the linemen can't hit, you know, so you can't really see, well, how are some of these, uh, you know, new linemen going to do on defense, you know, where they obviously need some help there. And, uh, you know, but then, you know, just just, just kind of want to see what kind of shape everybody's in. You know, how the new guys, the freshmen, I think they had a dozen freshmen who uh, enrolled early in January went through spring ball. Um, how are those guys doing? What, you know, how do they look like they could contribute, or they still, you know, maybe look like they haven't already played yet? We don't get any chances to speak with the coordinators uh, at all, really. I mean, you're really mm. just talking with Coach Pittman, and I, I don't know if you, you know, if you if you were able to sit and talk with Coach Odom about. The, the 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 scheme that they're going to be running it's going to be different you know you, you, the, the Sam Pittman talked about more depth on the defensive line there might be there will be should be more opportunities to 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 get an odd man blitz to pressure the quarterback to create some havoc in the backfield and that was one thing that coach Pittman really did press at SEC media days was to see more success defensively on first down, which didn't happen a lot last year, and and that's something that I'd like to hear the defensive coordinator talk about. Well, we are going to get the assistant coaches for one day. If you look at the camp schedule um, that we got emailed out, we're going to get the assist, each assistant coach one day. So that's not you know, but that I think that'll be it for the year. So, but that's better than nothing. So we will get a chance to talk to Barry. I can't remember the exact date, but. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. Last year, defensive line was an issue. Obviously, for them, that they went with the three-man front a lot. That was kind of a necessity because, <clears throat> excuse me, I think you know Barry felt like they had you know more defensive backs and maybe defensive linemen. So they played a lot of five, even six-man, uh, you know, defensive backs. Did a lot of dropping. You know, they did. There was a real struggle to get pressure on the quarterback. Um, but they've added some guys. Uh, you know, they got everybody back with Jonathan Marshall, who's, you know, big loss, very, very good player and had a great year for him. So, yeah, it'll be interesting. I think they will go, you know, more four down linemen, uh, you know, probably do more blitzing because um, they, they do have some experience, you know, back there at linebackers and, and then secondary. But, um, yeah, I thought Barry Odom, you know, and the defensive staff did a good job last year kind of, you know, making the best of who they had. They had some good players, but they didn't have enough of them, and certainly not up front. And then when they got hit with COVID in that LSU game, it just was, you know, killed them. And they still almost had a shot to win that game. But, yeah, you feel like, you know, they recruited and, and added some some good players, you know, got some got some guys to the transfer portal who have played previously. And so, you know, we'll see how that goes. But like I say, until they get the pads on, it's really hard to, to draw conclusions, I think. Last thing here, um, you know, we haven't had a chance to talk to you since the NBA draft. Moses Moody goes 
uh, 14th to Golden State. And, and you wrote about something that I feel like Razorback fans really were able to pick up on pretty quickly, uh, watching how Moses played in his year with the Razorbacks and, and the way that he spoke in, in press conferences and interviews and, and all of that. And I see how Bob Myers describes him as an old soul. Now, that was something mm-hmm. we all kind of picked on, on pretty quickly. Like That was the thing about Moses, aside from his physical attributes and the way that he played the game, and he could kind of do a little bit of a lot of everything, was that there, there was a, um, man, he just seemed, to, he seemed older, and I mean in a really good way, than the year that he was listed at as a freshman. Yeah, he was 18 that whole season. He didn't turn 19 until May uh, 31st. I had to look that up. So I could his birthday off the top of my head. But, um, yeah, I mean, Moses obviously is very physically gifted. But, you know, mentally he was ahead of most freshmen too, most college players. I thought that was a very telling statement when Bob Myers said, you know, they worked him out. And, you know, not all their support guys, are, you know, know everything about every player. And so they, you know, after Moses worked out, they said, well, what would you think? And then they were like, well, is he a junior or senior? You know, and I was a freshman. And I said, he was 18 the whole year. But, you know, um, he really took the coaching, as Eric Musselman has stated. And, you know, he was very diligent in film study that Eric talked about. Um, you know, they do film during team meals. And the idea was just kind of to have something for the guys to look at. And maybe they'd check it out while they're eating. And Moses was like, you know, never took his eyes off. But I, I guess he maybe had to look up and see what he was put on his fork or spoon or whatever. But, um, yeah, he was just very advanced in all facets of the game, whether it was, you know, work ethic, uh, you know, the, the skill set, um, preparation, practice. Talk about how serious he was in practice when he was out there shooting by himself, maybe getting extra practice in. And one playing music, one kidding around. He was just very, very serious. And um, I'm not saying he doesn't have a good time, but, um, yeah, he's he just very, very advanced. Oh, was just an old soul. It made him sound like he was from, you know, Bulgaria or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I thought that was a very interesting way. I also found out, looking at Bob Myers, he played at UCLA when they beat Arkansas in the championship game. He, did, he was a walk-on, I think, at that time and didn't play. But he actually played the next couple of years, was a pretty good player for UCLA. Bob, real quick before we let you go, uh, we talked earlier about there's five now going to be five uh, Razorbacks in the Hall of Fame. Do you know how many Mizzou uh, alums are in? Gosh, I hadn't even thought about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bob, there are three SEC schools without any Pro Football Hall of Famers. Mizzou is not one of no. them. So I kind of I knew we'd kind of put you on the spot here, but you do have the the Venus flytrap memory, and you are a you know, you're um, a Mizzou grad, so we figured we'd put you on the spot with this. Yeah, they have good players from my career, I'm like Phil Bradley and James Wilder. And, um, Paul Christman was a really good player from the 40s, but I don't think he did much in the NFL that I can remember. Howard Richards was a real good offensive lineman, played for the Cowboys. Um, off the top of my head, I can't tell you who's from Mizzou is in the Hall of Fame. There's two. Roger Worley, really? a mm-hmm. cornerback, and Kellen Winslow. Uh, the, the okay, yeah, I, should have thought, I, I covered Winslow. I should have thought. Yeah, Roger Worley, he played for the Cardinals um, when I was growing up. And, yeah, if, I, I should have been telling Winslow. I, actually, he was a senior my freshman year. So I covered him, and he was a great player. I was had a great pro career. But, yeah, I should have been able to think of Winslow for sure. And Roger Worley was, he was a great player, too. Johnny Rowland was a really good running back, but not a Hall of Famer. So well, that's good. Good to know. Who are the three SEC teams without anybody in the Hall of Fame? You want to take a guess? You probably have a good idea of which at least two of the schools. Hmm. I'm going to guess Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt would be one. That's the easy one. Although they had some really good players back in the 30s and 40s. and then, I think Jay um, Cutler's going to fall just short. Yeah. Um, Mississippi State and South Carolina mm-hmm. are the other two. Okay, okay. Well, yeah, I might have guessed Kentucky. And um, Arkansas, once J.C. Peters really. goes in. And Peters is going to go in. Uh, we'll have more okay. than uh, Oklahoma and Nebraska, which is very interesting. Wow. Yeah, and we'll have as many That's as UCLA. Um, all right, Bob, yeah. we'll leave it at that. Appreciate you. Good to be back with you. And uh, next week, there'll be some, there'll be, there'll be about a week of practice to talk about. Have a great weekend. Okay, you guys take care. Appreciate it, Bob. Bob Holt, Arkansas Democrat Gazette.
I always feel good if I, like, give him some information about Mizzou. <laughs> like, he does have that Venus flytrap. Oh, yeah. It is kind of amazing sometimes. 877-377-6963 to get with us in the final segment. We had, a, we had a question. Is today National Oyster Day or National Underwear Day? These two things really kind of work independently mm-hmm. of themselves. <laughs> also brought to you by Pradco Outdoor Fishing. Summertime means pond and creek fishing. Nothing catches bass and bluegill in a pond like the Rebel Crick Hopper. Twitch it, pop it, walk it, swim it. It's the ultralight fishing lure. Looks and acts like a real grasshopper. The Crick Hopper works great in tandem with light spinning rods and reels for a six-pound fishing line at Walmart, Bass Pro Shops, Academy, LearnNet.com, and Tackle Shops everywhere. The Rebel Crick Hopper. Halftime, right back.